It is January 14th, 2020, and on today's edition of KSO Today, I'll take a detailed look at tonight's matchup between K-State and Texas Tech, stealing all of my hoops knowledge from KSU fan, as I always do. I'll talk a little bit about yesterday's basketball press conference, and of course, you know, the news Grant Flanders have been all over for quite some time. Uh, the commitment of UTEP transfer Casey Asagu. I'm not sure on the last name pronunciation. I'm confident Casey is how you pronounce his first name, so... I will probably call him Casey, the first name of the show, although I certainly not on a first name basis with him. Um, we'll talk a lot about that. I do want to take a moment, which I'll do every day on this show, to thank our sponsors for the support they give us. Uh, People's State Bank has locations in Manhattan, uh, McDonald, Colby, Hoxie, Goodland, Oakland, Leonardville, Joaquini, Hill City, and actually have two in Manhattan. So if you're close to any of those places, a lot of small towns throughout the state, it's a great place for you to look or here in town. Um, Legacy Insurance, you know, partners with People's State Bank and, of course, with us. They're located in Manhattan on Seth Child Road, and their website can be located at www.legacysolutionsks.com. So let's get back to talking about sports here a little bit. Of course, I think probably the biggest news is, is finally the Casey Asagu or just the Casey transfer from UTEP. An interesting situation, of course. Um, Grant Flanders has a ton on this on the site on what it means is probably the best thing to read from him on this if you're really looking to understand this recruitment. I'll give a few points out of it, but don't want to give it all away because selfishly that's a, that's a pay story for us and I don't want to uh, give it all away. But he's an interesting thing. Now, I'll say right off the bat, a lot of people ask you about it right away, like how, how good is this guy? One, I mean, I don't know. Everyone who's trying to project out how good somebody is as a recruit, we're all guessing, of course. So um, on paper as a recruit, it's not terribly impressive. You know, it's not a guy who who had a ton of other offers in this process, although I'll explain that right now. He's not a guy who went and lit it up in his year at UTEP and put up 10 and 10 as a freshman or something like that. Um, there are questions about him for sure. I'm not telling everyone this is somebody that is a slam dunk great addition or be happy about. That said, when people ask that question, the answer I'm typically giving them behind the scenes is like, well, I mean, I can tell you the K-State coaches really, really wanted him. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, it's going to be perfect. They've had a number of players they brought in who haven't worked, of course, like any coaching staff, and a number of brought in that have. So I know K-State really liked this kid for a long period of time as they were talking over and over again about press conferences about looking for somebody who can match, you know, McCall Mawain's athleticism and, and defensive potential. Um, this was one of the people they were talking about and really the guy they were talking about after they lost Jethro Muscat and I think to Kansas. I think it became, you know, probably a focus here if you're looking at, you know, a next level down of guy to try to take. So, um, and I know they've also done a lot of research. I won't give all the numbers away again because that just seems like I shouldn't for free, but um, they've done a lot of research, you know, into his, his pick and roll defense, what percentage he finishes at around the rim, um, what percentages he block shots at the rim, how he does uh, hedging on screens, that kind of stuff. So yeah, some of his numbers are better in those areas than they are in just his generic numbers. So K-State thinks they have somebody they can develop into a very good defensive four or five. Um, and then offensively, yeah, he's going to be limited. And that's not exciting to hear. I know after seeing Max struggle, you know, to make – uh, sometimes simple finishes inside and other bigs. So, but I, I think it's a guy they think is going to fit around what they have. We'll have to wait and see. You know, all things go how they should, or they hope they will with the transfer. He would be eligible to play next season as a sophomore. Um, and he's he's got a good body. I mean, you can look at some of the pictures Flanders has put in these photos. He's really really put together for a you know true six ten six eleven. We saw him in Manhattan in person um, this year, so I mean those heights are pretty legit. He's he's put together. Um, you know, as a recruit, a couple of little notes I would throw in um, before he we went to UTEP in 2018. You know, Casey was ranked as the ninth best player in Canada uh, in his class. And then I think a, a note that I've you know kind of wanted to share is people are going to look around and say, and I, like I said earlier in the show. Not a lot of other offer, offers for, for Casey Asagu right now, but part of it is K-State can absorb him right now. Um, it's not good to have open scholarships. It's not good to have one open because Sean Williams left or because, you know, you gave one to Pierce and McAfee because you had one open anyway. Those are problems. I'm not praising it. But in this instance, this was a kid who talked to some other schools, but they couldn't absorb him right now, which K-State essentially can. So that helps some in that, pro that process. We'll see what happens. Um, other questions I know people ask is, what does it do with some other focuses of theirs, whether that's Carlton Lingard, a four-star four junior college post that Grant Flanders has written about recently on the site, or like a guy like Kobe Clark from Vashon, um, a high school kid they're looking at who's a small forward. It doesn't do anything for either. Um, it's a good question. It's reasonable to ask, but K-State – was informing those players, all the three that I've mentioned, I think that there's plans to take multiple players still in this class, and it's not an either or. So the addition of Casey doesn't make it harder to get Carlton Lingard just because they're both, you know, junior college type age players at a big position. Um, looking forward to see what happens to that. There's still a lot more recruiting to come in this class. Flanders has done a very, very good job with it, I, I really, really believe. 
Um, and on rec basketball, I guess I could say, I think there's a good chance that we may have a coffee with Chris this week, and it may not even feature Chris Lowry as much as a different assistant. So we'll wait and see how that goes. I think, I think multiple assistants will be there, though, assuming all goes well. Uh, let's talk briefly about the press conference yesterday. We were at full videos of both Bruce Weber, Dejuan Gordon, and of course, Xavier Sneed are available at our YouTube page for free. Um, if you're not subscribed to that and you're listening to this, I know how corny this pitch is, but there is a red button on YouTube in the bottom right of your screen. If you press it, um, you'll subscribe to our site. You don't have to pay us anything. We won't be sending you emails, that kind of stuff, but it is helpful for our business. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you're seeing that red button, I would sure take a press of that button if you don't mind. But either way, the press conference was interesting, um, and I kind of expected this was going to happen as soon as Bruce Weber said it, but I thought Bruce Weber did a good job of praising Dejuan Gordon for the um, leadership he's shown, for the initiative, initiative he's taking in practice, and one way he tried to do that was saying, hey, and Dejuan's a guy who gets on the coach and says we need to do more more competitive grit, more competitive drills, and uh, pushes us to be better too. And I, I knew as soon as Bruce said that, people would take it as literally as possible and say, well, Dejuan Gordon cares more about practicing hard and being competitive than Bruce Weber and the staff. That is 100% not the case. Dejuan Gordon would tell you the same thing. I know that for a fact. Um, I say that from a perspective of somebody who's been able to go to multiple practices every year of KSO, you know, including this year, um, who talks to these guys on and off the record, uh, coaches, players, that kind of stuff. That, that quote um, shouldn't be run with the way it was, in my opinion. People can say what they want. That is just my opinion, too, and that's, you know, it can be a biased one as well, but uh, the practices for K-State haven't changed from last year to this year. They haven't taken out competitive drills. They're not doing things, you know, that helped them win the Big 12 last year or the Elite Eight two years ago. It's the same kind of practices. Bruce Weber was trying to praise a kid for always pushing them in practice, and I thought he did it well. Um, I actually kind of liked the quote, but I, I guess I assumed I would understand there was some context to it. That said, uh, I did have a criticism in my, you know, posts about Bruce Weber yesterday in the press conferences. Like, I, I really um, am a fan of how Bruce Weber acts as a person. I think he's very transparent. I think he's very honest. I think he's a good person, and that matters to me, and I respect that. So when he's talking about hoping things go well and believing things continue to go well, I, I, he's being honest, and that's real. But I do wonder, and this comes from a you know a, a very low-level retail background where I've never coached a, a stressful game in my life or had to leave a stressful program in my life, if, if there wouldn't be some benefit right now to these guys hearing just some more confidence that they will get there. Um, but that's at the same time, that's not who Bruce has been. He doesn't go out of his way to say things that aren't real to him. Uh, but I do still think this is a time where these kids need some confidence, whether it comes externally from their head coach creating it um, in an artificial manner, even, even or getting it from a win tonight against Texas Tech. Either one would be big because this K-State team is really struggling right now. I do want to take a little bit of time looking at tonight's Texas Tech game. Of course, the Wildcats and Red Raiders will tip off just after 7 o'clock. This evening in Bramlage Coliseum, full coverage tonight. We'll have highlights. We'll have the press conferences. We'll have the final, which will include all my notes, but really the important stuff from KSU underscore fan. And then the X's and O's from Chris Nelson, where if you don't read are really, really cool. How many plays that he goes through and explains to you what happened in a game is really, really neat. But I'm just going to run through some advanced statistics that at KSU underscore fan has given me. Again, all these are credit to him, um, but these are more fun to me than regular old statistics to give you a sense of kind of what to look at tonight. The pace of these teams is very, very, very similar. Um, K-State's is pretty slow at 251st. That's, you know, best. So 251st is pretty slow in the country. Tech's at 218, so not very different. Um, but as you go down the line of, of things within those possessions, Tech has been the better team so far this year. Tech beats K-State, you know, in points per possession. Uh, excuse me, this is when K-State's offense is against Tech's defense. Tech beats them in points per possession, field goal percentage, turnover percentage, offensive rebound percentage. There's really not one thing when K-State has the ball against Texas Tech where you point at it and say K-State is better at that. Some of those are close that I just talked about, but in reality, just to break it down, Tech's points per possession defense is 11th best in college basketball. K-State's points per possession offense is 202nd best. So, if you think K-State's going to have a hard time scoring tonight, those numbers would tell you you're probably right. We flip to the other side, and K-State does dominate this matchup too, meaning K-State's defense versus Tech's offense. You know, K-State's better at points per possession, e field goal percentage, turnover percentage, um, three-point percentage, and then a couple minor edges for Tech and a couple of evens. So it's not as big of a mismatch. K-State's points per possession defense is number 38 in the country compared to Tech's 11th, as I told you earlier. But Tech's points per possession offense is 94th. That's not elite. But that's top 100. So you're comparing really the matchup for me is K-State's offense versus Tech's offense. And if you're looking at these stats that Jimmy provides for us, you've got the 202nd best offense versus the 94th best offense with two great defenses. I think Texas Tech's the better team. They've been the better team all year. 
I do believe K-State beats some teams at home this year. Probably even some good teams here and there. Could happen tonight. But until they do, uh, I'll pick Texas Tech to win a low-scoring game at Bramlage tonight, 59-52. to That's going to wrap up today's edition of KSO Today. Thanks again to People State Bank. Thank you to Legacy Insurance. Thanks for listening. Look forward to talking to you tomorrow.